Welcome to Generations of X, the podcast where we discuss the past, present, and future of all things X-Men. I am your co-host, the uncanny Dayspring. And I'm your other co-host, the adjectiveless Flinkman. And folks, as regular listeners know, we've been knee-deep in animated X-Men nostalgia for, for weeks now. And um, we have absolutely no desire to stop. So let's get right to it. Dayspring, why don't you uh, introduce our guest? I'm just so excited. We have the incredible Larry Houston with us. He was storyboard artist and co-director of Pride of the X-Men, as well as producer and director of the iconic X-Men animated series. Larry, welcome. Hi, guys. Glad to be here. Glad you invited me. Yeah, yeah. We're so, so, so glad to have you. Uh, So, Larry, the first question I want to ask you is you are actually the uh, first African-American storyboard artist uh, ever hired for a Saturday morning cartoon show. Uh, Congratulations on that. How How did that feel? What was that like? You know, at the time, I was happy to have a job. Yeah. (laughs) You're not thinking Um, about the impact. You're just happy to be working. Yeah. At the time, at the time, it was more of a... um, a real meritocracy back then because um, the I didn't know I had broken a, a, a glass ceiling until I talked to my friend um, Floyd Norman, who was the first black animator over at Disney. Yeah. And we got in a conversation we were and he told me I had broken a glass ceiling. I really didn't know. And I had to go back and research it with my friends. And yeah, I was the first one that got hired there and I was a uh, first black storyboard artist. And then after that, you know, a lot of more black artists came on board over at Filmation Studios. Yeah. But at the time, um, I was just happy to get a job. I was, <laughs> you know. Yeah. You know, I, accidentally you know, uh, making history. Yeah. Seven years prior to that, I was fixing computers for a living. Really? Oh, well, that's quite a jump. Yeah. And I just I hit a epiphany. At, I think I was like 24, 25. And I wanted to see if I could make it as an artist. So I, I, I left computers. I went for a job interview at Filmation. And um, I didn't do my due diligence. I went in to try and get a layout job. But my, my anatomy wasn't strong enough. But the supervisor saw my uh, portfolio, which I had a lot of, um, I had drawn my samples from Marvel or DC, you know, trying to get hired as an artist there. And so he introduced me to um, the storyboard supervisor. He gave me a test, which I did, it didn't seem that hard. I took, I took it, brought it back the next day, and I impressed him that I did it so quickly. Yes. But, also, but also the fact that he had given me a live script. Everybody in the, in the office was working on a script. And he liked it so much, he put it into the show, and then I got hired that same day. Awesome. Yes, that's wow. incredible. That's well, that's a testament. Just, not only your your talent, but your work ethic as well. Congratulations on that! Oh, thanks. It, it was a serendipity. A lot of it's like everything came together at the right yeah. place at the right time. I love that. Well, it it certainly did because we are huge fans of your work, and we're so glad all those all those pieces fell together. But before we continue diving into your work, I I do want to know. We know you're a lifelong X Men fan. What is your earliest memory with the X Men? Oh, wow. Um, my earliest memory would be, um, I think it was either the Mimic or it was the Juggernaut. Um, one of the X-Men books way back when, 7, 9, 11, somewhere back then. That's where yeah. I bought it off. Back then we had, uh, you know, spinner racks. Mm-hmm. And so I just oh, I it those. off the spinner wrap. And that's, that was one of my earliest to the X-Men that I can remember is one of those two issues. I, 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 they blur together right now. Hmm. Yeah. So, uh, you know, first issue aside, who uh, is your favorite X-Man just like of all time? <laughs> yeah, it's like picking your kids, you know, right? uh, <laughs> it's hard. It's tough. It's yeah. Because the, the core team has been Xavier, Gene and Scott were that's, that's the core group. Um, but since, you know, fast forward to, you know, when it got rebooted again, then you got Storm, you got, you got Wolverine, you got um, Nightcrawler. It's like, you got a potpourri of like, I yeah. don't know which one to pick. <laughs> you got to have a favorite from every era at this point, basically. <laughs> yeah. It's like the best of all, the best of both worlds, the early ones and the current ones. 
Yeah, for um, sure. For sure. Um, do you have a least favorite one out of curiosity? <laughs> <laughs> I guess the ones that are hardest to draw for me. Oh, well, um, that, that's funny because I was about to ask you about who was your favorite and least favorite character to draw. So I get it's probably going to disappoint a lot of people, but Cable is hard as hell to draw. <laughs> He's got, got all, a lot of stuff going he's on. He's got this crap all over him and stuff. And it's like, it's not a symmetrical costume. It's asymmetrical. So you got to make sure to put it on the, you know, stuff on the right side and make sure the right eye is glowing and all that padding and stuff. It was like, it was crazy. You know, I'm glad, at least for, for me as an artist, um, we I just have to design like one model sheet with, uh, <laughs> five, with five turns. Yeah. And after that, it's up to the overseas. <laughs> <laughs> Complicated uh, cable with all those pouches. I believe it. I believe it. So, but who was your favorite character to animate? Oh, the two characters that are easiest to animate is it's the girls, uh, Rogue, Storm. Yes. Um, you know, they they their their costumes are easy enough. You can draw it really quickly, and it's easy to you know they're flying and or punching or something. Um, and, 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 you know, Wolverine to a degree, you know, I like him because he's easy to draw. It just looks like you're going to, the, you know, you're going to, the, he's always, you know, like that. <laughs> coming at you. For so, circle uh, rage right there. Yeah. He's always, that's easy to draw too. Yeah, I so can definitely I, see that. I did a lot of those that when I go to, I, well, I used to go to conventions and then I would draw <laughs> for fans, you know, those characters for them. Yeah. We miss yeah. conventions here. Uh, well, as a, uh, as Dayspring mentioned before you um, before you joined the team that gave us the iconic 90s animated series, you actually worked on the standalone uh, Pride of the X-Men pilot as the storyboard yeah. artist and co-director. <laughs> what we we have some some fond memories of that actually, but what was that experience like for you? For me, it was we were trying our best to get we wanted to get the X-Men on the air. Yeah. Back in the 80s. And we were like, we got the best Japanese studio, I think it was Toy Animation, to what? do the animation. Um, the three of us, is myself, uh, Rick Holberg and Will Minio. We were the three, he did, I think Will did act one, Rick did act two, I did act three. But we we're all on the same page as to what we wanted the show to be. And we poured our hearts out to get it in, to get it out there, to try and get, um, try and get it on the air. But at the time, the zeitgeist back then was like, it, it wasn't ready for it. The, there was only three buyers, CBS, NBC, and ABC. Yeah. They had no idea what a mutant was. What's an X-Men? Who's going to watch this? It's too complicated. You know, uh, they, you know, they just didn't get it. So it didn't go anywhere. But we at least tried to put yeah. it out there. So. You know. Well, we, we love Pride of the X-Men. And I, I'm curious, so... How was that first pitch to you? How did that project first look like when it came to you? It was what they, what it was is that we had been the advert, the big, our biggest uh, advocate for the show was my boss, Margaret Lesh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously Stan Lee, but she was the one force behind it. And they, they found, they found some money in a budget from another <laughs> show. We were working on um, a Robocop. So they, found money, they put it aside, and they used that money for the X-Men pilot to try and get, you know, prior to the X-Men to try and get it sold to a network back then. Hook those and books so, just to get to that pilot, just to get that <laughs> pilot. <laughs> but, you know, unfortunately that, as good as it was, um, uh, we had to make compromises, you know, like Wolverine talking Australia and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, we wanted to do the Sentinels, but the people there wanted to sell plastic. And so that's how we got Magneto and, you know, uh, Toad and the rest of them, because they figured they're gonna have a, here's a, you know, bunch of characters they could sell as toys and stuff. So we just kind of like, okay, we just want to get the damn thing on the air. We want to sell it. <laughs> and so. Yeah, uh, so I actually want to ask you about, about the cast, uh, both the heroes and the villains, because obviously most you know, most of the heavy hitters are there on, on, on both sides of it, but also you had characters like uh, Dazzler and Emma Frost who actually are those, 
Those are my two favorite, like all time <laughs> favorite characters. So I'm so stoked that they were there. How is that cast determined? Um, that was pretty much the three of us. We picked, um, when they told us that we needed to get a cast of characters, we obviously knew it was going to be Magneto. And so then it was just, we were just populating the, the, uh, the cast with other characters. And uh, we didn't want to just have one, you know, woman, I think, what is it, Dazzler? Dazzler and Storm. And Storm, yeah. So it, we threw, yeah. So we just kind of, um, let's see, I'm trying to remember the bad guys. The bad guy is Magneto. Juggernaut, oh, Toad. Juggernaut, Toad. Pyro. Uh, yeah. And um, Emma, I think. Emma and Frost. Emma. Yeah. Yeah, we um, we kind of gave her modified power so it looked like <laughs> she had something physical, I, you know. The, I the love that. that opening scene where she like creates the mental lightning bolt and is Magneto, your deliverance is at hand. Magneto, yeah. your deliverance is at hand. <laughs> Who is this woman in white and what is she doing? And I, I loved it. I loved it. So so you're saying when that you guys came, came up with that cast of characters because I was going to ask, like, did you inspire the arcade game or did the arcade game inspire you guys? Yeah, it came from us. We were just trying to come up with what we thought was the best combination of characters. Um, I, it's one of my favorite that, lineups. Yeah. Oh, good. I'm glad you liked it. You know, um, with her, you know, we we knew we had to do something more physical because like mental powers is kind of like yeah. kind of boring on television. So that's why we gave us something to, to throw or to do, you know, something visual for kids to see. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I think that that's probably part of the reason that Dazzler was selected as well is because she has a real visual power with her lasers exactly. and light shows. Yeah, exactly. She works well for television, that, yeah. those kind of powers. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm glad Dazzler works good for something, Flink. <laughs> <laughs> um, shady, 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 shady. Uh -huh. um, but no, I. So we, we, you're, you're deciding who is going to be on the cast. You know, the network wants to sell toys. You know, you were considering the Sentinels. Were there any characters that you were considering that almost made the cut, but ultimately you guys didn't make the cut, or they didn't make the cut? Excuse me. I'm trying to think. I think. Um... On the X-Men side, you know, there are characters we wanted to include that we, you know, Iceman and and some other characters, but um, we just had to call it down to something we thought we could work with. I got gotcha. you. You know, then pair them against the good guys and bad guys, because we gave each one a moment, like Colossus versus, you know, Juggernaut. We gave each one their own moment in the in the show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we kind of like paired it off like that. I wanted to ask because I am a crazy Jean Grey fan. <laughs> and I, I have to ask, was she ever considered to be part of the cast? Or are we correct to assume that she could have been dead because of Dark Phoenix? Well, are we talking about the, the uh, pride or are we talking about for the... pride for pride for pride? Um, I'm not. Let's see. I'm trying. I got to think about it because I don't remember why we didn't why we didn't include her because because dazzler's superior <laughs> <laughs> i mm. i honestly don't remember other than um I, she might have got swapped out for dazzler <gasps> she might have gotten Thank swapped you. out for dazzler I'm... dazzler's revenge for <laughs> dazzler's revenge she's due for another revenge <laughs> um i'd have to talk to my friends um about that cuz that's uh, there was a lot of compromises all over for picking stuff, like, picking the characters. It wasn't our first choices because it would have been Jean Grey. But, you know, when you wait, did, wait, I, I, I figured there wait, had wait, to wait, been wait, some did corporate synergy. Their, their, their first choice would have been Jean Grey. OK. Really? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, I think, by the way, I think Dazzler was phenomenal in that series. And I love it because Dazzler and the cast that you guys ultimately went with. Oh, thanks. It's we had fun with it, and we the one thing the one thing we to keep in mind was that since it was a pilot, if we had gotten the green light for a series, we would have expanded stuff. Yeah, yeah. this is just it's almost like a sales tool. We were putting it out there for the networks to see, and for mm. someone to to say, yeah, look, we want to put that on NBC or CBS and stuff. And right. so it everything could have gotten bigger and larger with if we had gotten the go-ahead 
Well, let me tell you, I would have loved to have seen the go-ahead because I love the animation. I love Toei so much. What was it like working? They they were a powerhouse. They've given us Sailor Moon and other great properties. What was it like mm -hmm. working with them in the 80s? Oh, it was great. I mean, they were on board with it when they saw what we were trying to do. Um, Will Min all three of us, my, uh, myself, Will, Minnie, and Rick, um, we were all fans of anime back when it was just coming into the United States. So we had been watching all the anime shows. We had been studying their techniques and we were incorporating what we saw into the shows we were working on. And so mm. um, when we sent the shows overseas, they saw in the storyboards what we were trying to, we were trying to emulate some of the stuff that they do normally. And so they yeah. really, it really helped that they saw what we were, what we were trying to do. And then they, they could push it even further. We're using their own um, animation directors and, and to make it even better. So we were on the same page and we, I think Will went over, he might've went over to a uh, toy, but I'm not sure. Or maybe the, maybe the director came here and talked to us. But anyway, we had a good rapport with them and mm. everybody was hoping for, you know, you know, two or three year pickup. So wait, so were you planning for a two to three year pickup? Did you actually have scripts? pass or ideas like at least brainstormed pass that initial pilot no no scripts just um thumbnail ideas of like um okay we can we could go in this direction we could introduce the sentinels we can introduce um sunfire you know characters arcs along the way but it was nothing more than like a, a bullet point like a, on a sheet of paper a bullet point of things that could happen in the future yeah. Where, where, was there a specific bullet point that you were most excited for to to tackle? Because you're saying Sunfire and the Sentinel in that animation, and I, my eyes are spinning. So, <laughs> so I, was there one point, was there a story idea that you would have loved to have explored on that Pride universe? Um, back, you're taking me back. Back in the, <laughs> that would be like the mid 80s. And um, I think what happened was, um, some of the what we were trying to do at that point with Pride got pushed forward when we did the actual X Men. Gotcha. And when we talked to yeah. the editors, we gave them we we told them about the ideas that we wanted to do, and you know they went through it and just kind of like pick and chose different things. But the one thing that we were strongly for is like, look, we got to do the X Men has have got to face the Sentinels. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah that was like. Sure. That's the one thing that they stopped us from doing before and said, look, we got to get, get the Sentinels. Um, New York at the time, Marvel New York thought we were like crazy. They said, look, no, you got to bring, um, you know, bring out Magneto and, and Apocalypse as the first villains that they face. And we're going, no, 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 no. You guys don't, know. <laughs> you don't get it. We, we're trying to introduce the X-Men to not just the, the core audience, but to yeah. a larger audience. Yeah. You know, because like, satisfying maybe two million viewers we wouldn't last on the air like a week you had to get 10 or 15 million viewers just to stay on the air yeah and so yeah. you gotta you gotta make the stories uh true to what the mythology is but you also gotta make it accessible to the larger public and so you can't go that deep into the mythology from day one right you gotta no. slowly bring people into it spoon, spoon feed them Right. Yes. And, yeah. and and something, you know, the the says the minority, the mutants as as other with humans as an adversary is so core to what the X-Men are all about. So I'm really glad that you guys uh, fought for that and were able to get it, you know, eventually included in um, X-Men, the animated series. But um, with, with Pride, so it, it, it aired on the Marvel Action Universe Hour in 1988. Um, both of us, you know, like we've said, we we loved it, but it it, it, it didn't so receive a positive reaction overall. Did you, did you get a call from, from the network or anyone involved saying, you know, well, that didn't go as planned or did you like kind of anticipate that it wasn't gonna, gonna go well? We kind of anticipated only because the viewing before the public saw it, um, uh, we, we got a hint that the networks were confused, confused by it. And we were going, uh oh, that's not a good sign. Yeah. So when it did, when it did air, and it, you know, 
and we didn't get a reaction from the networks that like, you know, a pickup. We were going, okay. We kind of anticipated it. Yeah. Um, so, but who are these know. narcs? Who are these narcs? I want to know. I give me all their names. <laughs> yeah. They're no, those got those sensor people and those execs are no longer there anymore. Yeah. But well, the, the, the strong, the, the thing is, is that what put the X-Men on the air was my, the, my boss, uh, Margaret Lesh, because she was my, she was the force behind the, the, um, pride. Now you fast forward about four or five years she gets the job to be the head of Fox Kids. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the first things she did was call me up saying, we're doing the X-Men. And it's like, yes. Yes. And um, she called me in and Will in and Rick in and two story editors. And we put together a plan of, of how to do the show over. We had to pick up for 13 episodes. And so we kind of plotted out the, the storyline for 13 of what we're going to try and accomplish uh, in this season. Cause you got to remember, we had no guarantee of season two, three, four, five, right. it was just one season. So we could, we plotted out what we could do in one season and that's it. And um, you can see it. If you look at it, you can see a similarity in, in pride is that you have a gr- young girl who comes to the X-Men who doesn't know, what it's all about. She gets introduced to the characters. When we did the X-Men, the animated series, Jubilee gets yeah. brought into the system and she has no idea what's going on. And it's, it's basically that storyline of like um, Stranger in a Strange Land as the character, as the, as the environment is explained to the main character, it's explained to the, main, to the audience too. So mm. everybody's getting caught up to speed with all the complexity in yeah. a simple fashion. Yeah, so. and it, it, it's we we definitely have seen that parallels with Jubilee and Kitty Pride um, in terms of how that story. I, I want to jump into some X Men animated questions, but I have one more question about Pride, and <laughs> because there's this huge difference between when we were talking about to the Lee Walls about Stan Lee's involvement, and then obviously his involvement in Pride. What, what was Stan's involvement like in Pride? Because he does actually narrate that opening scene with Emma. Did you, yeah. were you open to that? Was he, was it something that just happened? What were your thoughts on Stan's involvement? Oh, Stan was heavily involved. And that's what he's always wanted to do is be on camera, in, like introducing the show or narrating the show. And that was always your stick. I mean, I worked for Stan for like 12 years working at Marvel Productions. And that's what he, he always wanted to be Walt Disney, for lack of a better term. Like Walt Disney, Wonderful World of Color. I'm showing my age, but he was in that show. Walt was the, you know, the narrator on camera talking yeah. about what are we getting ready to see. And he also buttoned the, he was like the bookend of the show talking about what you just saw. And yeah. that's what Stan wanted to be. And yeah, that's exactly show. what the Leewalds told us too. Yeah, yeah, and um, because we were doing, we wanted to do something different with the X Men. It didn't go over well, <laughs> but we <laughs> had to tell Stan we're not doing that, Stan. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I, he didn't take it that well, but I think he understood what we were trying to do. 